All right. Hopefully you're looking at a big welcome mat. Welcome to Pub 101. We are all very glad that you're here. Uh, this is brought to you by the Open Education Network. We are a network of people who are working at institutions across the country to make higher education uh, more popular, more understood, and more effective throughout higher education overall. So I'm going to start by introducing myself. I'm publishing director at the OEN. I am the Pub 101 facilitator. I also host the publishing cooperative at the OEN, which is a community of people who have questions about how to publish open textbooks and who want to support one another in doing so. I also manage the open textbook library. And while the open education network is based at the University of Minnesota, I am based in California on the central coast. And in addition to having a professional life, one of the things I like to do in my personal life is wildlife habitat garden. So I plant plants for pollinators. I focus on native plants to the area and get a lot of um, pleasure out of that. I will now hand things over to Barb. Hello everyone, my name is Barb Thies and I am the community manager here at the OEN along with Karen. And what that means is really I'm the liaison between the organization and our members. And that being said, I know we have both members and non-members here. If any of you have any questions or wanna dig deeper into OER in general, or you have questions about the OEN, please feel free to reach out and I'm happy to connect you with more information. And on a personal note, I love to travel and formerly worked in study abroad. So I'm always down to exchange travel tips as well. Thanks, Barb. And in about 15, 20 minutes, we will also meet Christina Trinnell, who will be a second facilitator in today's session. So taking a look at our time together today, I'm going to spend a few minutes setting the scene and then talk about what exactly is Pub 101. I'll introduce Unit 1 very briefly, and uh, then I will hand things over to Christina to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, in publishing. If ever you have any questions as we're going along, if we make an assumption or jump too far ahead, please let us know in the chat. Uh, Barb and I will keep an eye on things, and um, away we go. So a little bit more about the Open Education Network. As I mentioned, we're based at the University of Minnesota. And really, we are a community of people, often librarians, instructional designers, administrators, who want more OER in higher ed. And we gather together and have some guiding principles uh, to guide our work and how we work together. And those include the common good, equity, inclusivity, action, humanity, integrity, and shared abundance. If you wanna learn more about how we define those principles, uh, that is on our website. But I think it's important as a touchstone and to ground us here together as we move through these seven weeks, just so you know a little bit more about the OEN, about us, and how we look to work together with you during our time. So my goal is to make this a positive experience for everyone. We are professionals and we all deserve courtesy and respect and I have every confidence that uh, we will provide that to one another. If you have any concerns along the way, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. So publishing. Publishing can mean many things and often it's you know, well into a conversation that I realize sometimes I may be defining publishing differently than someone else. So we have a really inclusive definition of publishing here together. It could mean any of the verbs you think of, like create, author, write, make. It's really easy uh, to publish in today's uh, online environment. But publishing may not mean making something from scratch. It could mean adapting, editing, or modifying something that already exists. This, of course, is one of the benefits of working with openly licensed material is that the creator has said, you know, please, according to the license I have assigned, adapt edit, modify this work, you know, just attribute accordingly. Uh, it means that you don't have to wait for a third edition before you update your journalism textbook, for example, when you have a really great example unfolding in real time that you might want to add. Publishing can also mean posting or archiving, making available different files in an institutional repository. 
I was reading through your introductions and class notes, and a few of you said this is what you're looking into. You're interested in sharing OER in your IR, and um, that is a wonderful service and value. The Open Textbook Library does not host files, for example. We really do rely on this community model. We point to the files where they live at institutions across the country and around the world. Publishing can also mean engaging students in creating content. That's frequently called open pedagogy. So it might not only be faculty who are writing content, it could be students, it could be faculty and students together and exploring an opportunity in creating a new resource. And of course, things can happen solo, they can happen collaboratively. And as the weeks go on, we'll talk a little bit about the trade-offs between sort of a DIY publishing program or someone who you know, is really motivated to get things done and might get it done from A to Z by themselves. And then we'll talk about how maybe you can contribute or support what more collaborative um, processes look like. So my goal is not to um, say that one is better than the other or say, here's what everyone should be doing in OER publishing. It really is to orient all of us to some of the common considerations in publishing and uh, OER publishing particularly. I will say that I believe, and many people believe, that publishing is really integral to the promise of open education. Through publishing and through editing and adapting, we can include more voices and perspectives in the learning content that is out there. People can localize or indigenize content so that it reflects the very specific student audience that they're working with. It means that you can update text to reflect the current moment, adding case studies, stories, interviews, multimedia, student voices. And as I just talked about, it also means students creating content. So Christina will talk more about um, how more voices and perspectives in open publishing is so important and integral to open education in just a few minutes. All right, so with that, I'm going to pause for a moment and take the temperature in the room and see how people are feeling about diving into OER. I know we're only a few minutes in here, but I'm curious to know, and we'll launch a poll, what each of you are thinking locally at this moment, the likelihood of supporting publishing at your institution this year. So for some of you, it might already be happening, Others, you're getting close, you're almost ready to go. Perhaps most of you are thinking, well, maybe one day, let's see. I only just got here, Karen. And uh, maybe some of you are like, I just wanna learn, but we do not have the capacity. I don't imagine we'll ever support publishing. That's okay too, everybody is welcome. We are approaching an 85% response rate. I'll give it another couple of seconds. Hopefully we can get to 100. It's anonymous, we'll never know. 96%. And we seem to be topping out at 96%. Oh, 97. Great. I, I feel like I'm a bingo announcer. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll, publish the results, so you can see how you compare with others at Pub 101. And we have a, a group that's, you know, learning. Maybe one day, maybe this will work for us, maybe we won't. Others who are more experienced, this is a great reminder, you know, it's not just the facilitators who are sharing information. I welcome and encourage all of you to share what you've learned so far in the chat with your colleagues in class notes. And for those of you who are almost ready to go and have been setting up programs, you probably have already learned through that process. So please share with one another. Thank you for your response. Now I'm going to go back to my slides. Okay, so what is Pub 101? Well, it's really a big picture orientation. Oh, I'm still sharing the poll, sorry. Okay, um, it's really a big picture orientation to publishing. We're not gonna get into the nitty gritty, for example, of how to create a chapter in press books. Those are the kind of topics we explore more deeply in the publishing cooperative and the OEN offers uh, dedicated workshops on how to, but Pub 101 is really a big picture about publishing. It's not really a class, there's no grades, come when you can. 
I will do every effort to document the sessions um, if you miss it. I also hope that it'll be a little fun. The stakes are low. Um, and really this is for you to learn from one another. And I will also say that Pub 101 is evolving. This is our third cohort and I have made changes based on your feedback between every cohort. So if we're missing the mark, if there's content that you're really looking for that isn't here, please do let me know in the unit feedback forms that are at the end of every unit in our curriculum. And then I'll also do a Pub 101 survey at the end of our experience. But you don't have to wait till then. If um, there's anything that concerns you, let me know. I also hope that Pub 101 is a beginning and not sort of a all-inclusive uh, uh, package that when you're finished, you're finished. We don't have to say goodbye when it's over. As I mentioned, you can join the publishing cooperative. Hopefully you will meet others who are working on this so that you never feel alone. So many of you um, are the one person working on OER at your institution, and that can be a little overwhelming. So um, that's one of the values of being a part of the OEN. Okay, you all by now, I think have seen our orientation one-stop document. This is where the schedule is, for example, where you can see all of the topics. I'm going to update that document weekly. So for example, today after Christina does her presentation, I will link to her slides. Um, you will find a link there to the YouTube playlist where you can find all of the videos. So if you're ever feeling like, where am I with Pub 101, uh, please go to that orientation document and hopefully it can help answer that question. I will also send weekly recap emails and previewing the uh, week to come. If you have never received an email from me and have no idea what I'm talking about, please put your email in the chat and I'll be sure to add you to the list so that you receive future communications. We also have a shared class notes. All of you are editors. So this is a place where if you see a topic coming up and you have a question and you wanna write it down in advance, that's a notepad for you, please do. If we run out of time today and you have a pressing question for Christina, uh, please make a note of it there and um, we'll do our best to get back to you. If you have questions you wanna ask one another, uh, that's the place to do it. So I hope that the class notes are useful to you. Thanks to all of you for introducing yourselves in that space. I had a chance to say hello to many of you. Feel free to say hello to one another. Um, and one of the other things that I do is, for example, uh, if there are lots of resources being shared in chat, you of course can share chat on your own, but I'll also post chat in the class notes so that you can go back there and say, now what was that thing somebody shared that one time? Hopefully you'll be able to find it there. All right, so the foundation of Pub 101 is a Canvas publishing curriculum has eight units. We're gonna focus really on five of them. And during Pub 101, we'll focus on open textbooks specifically. And open textbooks are defined as free to the end user. So students should be able to locate an, an all-inclusive, complete portable format without paying anything. And open textbooks have permissions, usually Creative Commons licenses to edit or modify that resource. If you're newer to OER and newer to Creative Commons licenses, we have some additional resources we can point to so you can get oriented uh, to that conceptually. There's also other people in the class, I'm sure, who can offer their favorite resources. But those are the two things to keep in mind. Of course, I know some of you are also interested in open journal publishing or publishing other OER. I absolutely think you'll be able to apply what you learn in Pub 101 to those interests. Um, just so you know, we'll, we'll be focusing on open textbooks, um, but there's more to it than that. So when I say textbook, just to break that down quickly, I'm talking about a learning object or a book that has structure. It includes pedagogical elements. So the information is hierarchically organized. It's different from a monograph. Hopefully there aren't just walls of, of explanatory text usually not in the first person. There's not an argument being made. It's more a survey of a subject area. And in addition to the structure being integral to what we think of with a textbook, 
That structure is also really essential and important to accessibility, that hierarchical um, organization of information. And we'll talk more about accessibility next week. So here's a visual of everything I just uh, laid out for you. On the left, you can see, I believe in French. I am uh, just started learning French last year. I think this is advanced French. Um, that is a monograph. There's a lot of text there. Um, and then on the right, you'll see from OpenStax, an example of chapter one biology. You have a header image, you have a chapter outline. It's organized 1.1, 1.2, there's an introduction. And just by looking at this one page, you know what to expect for chapter two and chapter three. You know how all of this information is gonna be structured throughout the book. So that's one of the things we're really interested in supporting and structuring uh, with our open textbook publishing support programs. If you have more questions about what an open textbook is and how you might work with faculty to come up with structures like this, you'll find it in unit one. Now, very briefly, I mentioned that Pub 101 is a pathway into the publishing cooperative. And simply the publishing cooperative at the OEN is a group of people who want to grow open textbook publishing expertise and capacity in higher education. That's what we're doing here. And of course, uh, one of the results of that is increasing the availability of open textbooks for people to use around the world. So it doesn't mean uh, that you need to be you know, running a publishing program and turning out 25 books a year to join the publishing cooperative. It's really just a group of people who are interested in this and want to support one another. Here's a list of people, well, rather institutions where people work who are part of the co-op and who support one another. We have a Google group uh, where we ask questions and continuing professional development. I mentioned uh, we've had press books workshops, accessibility workshops, more to come. So if that's something that interests you, um, please keep it in mind as we move through Pub 101 and I'll have more information at the end about the co-op. A related aside, another way that we support members is to provide access to an OEN Pressbook sandbox. So if as we're moving through Pub 101, you would like to experiment a little bit with Pressbooks, it's one of the ways you're thinking about possibly publishing. Uh, if you are an OEN member, either institutional or allied, there's one free project you can publish using our Pressbook Sandbox. If you are here because your consortium is a member of the OEN, there are five projects that a consortium can offer their institutions. And this is a real production space. It can really be published. It can use any Creative Commons license. And I put a short link there uh, if you would like to go ahead and sign up for the Sandbox. It's a really fun space, fun way to get to know the tool. And there's probably people in here who use Pressbooks and, and might be able to offer some support as well. There's also a really great um, sort of how-to information on using Pressbooks out there. So before I turn things over to Christina, I just want to welcome you again and say that while publishing can be an intimidating topic for many, and I wanna be realistic, it can be a very involved process for many, stretching into sometimes a few years. Uh, higher education is and can create academic content for students. I think it's in our mission and values to do so. And whenever it may be overwhelming with all of the finer details of how to publish and where to publish and, and how to meet a deadline, I hope that students can be our touchstone throughout the development process that we can always come back to what will work best for students. Okay, students are reading this and using this in a class. You know, what is going to be most effective for them? What do they have access to? I think it's just really always important to bring it back to students. But of course, we are all here together. Uh, we are professionals and um, it's important to take care of ourselves as well. And so this is a reminder, you're not alone. There's others here who are just starting out, who are just learning about OER and how to publish. And so you don't have to figure that out in isolation. And whether you're new or experienced, you have something to contribute. So thanks in advance for offering your questions, comments, experiences, fears uh, to this whole process. 
So now I would like to turn things over to Christina. Christina Trinnell is the TRAILS OER statewide coordinator in the Montana University System. And she's gonna be talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion when it comes to publishing. So take it away, Christina. Okay. Thank you, Karen. And let me switch over to my slides here. There we go. Can you see that? Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me. And I'm very excited to start the Pub 101 class with um, talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion and academic publishing. This is a topic that uh, like many others, I'm quite passionate about. Um, and it's something that when I got into open education um, about 15 years ago, I was really excited to see change. And it's, it's kind of that unrealized potential um, of OER. And so hopefully uh, this conversation, other conversations like that are gonna help affect some really good change in um, open educational resources and making more diverse content. So I like to start off with um, every talk that I give uh, with a moment of mindfulness. So I'm gonna ask you all to participate with me and I'm gonna actually stop my video for a second um, and invite you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. And you can stop your video if you like or leave it on. Um, and I want you each to think about and reflect on something that gives you comfort. Um, that could be an image, a space, a person, a um, food item, an object, it's something that you find comfort in and just really spend a minute thinking about that item. And now I want you to spend a minute and think of something similarly. It can be a variety of uh, material types, but something that brings you peace, that you find peace in. And then my last question for you uh, is to think about a word one word that describes how you feel about addressing diversity or equity issues. How does that make you feel? And if you uh, are comfortable, I'd like us to come back to the, uh, to the screen. And I'd like you to enter that word into chat if you feel comfortable sharing um, that. And I thank you for taking that moment with me. Um, even if it's brief, I feel like it kind of brings us back together and centers us on what I hope will be a really good conversation. So as you're sharing those words, thank you for adding those. Um, <laughs> the biggest question that comes up with a lot of people that I talk with about DEI issues is, are they comfortable? <laughs> and, and, and typically the answer is no. <laughs> There's some apprehension. Um, oh, I like those words. Thank you. Uh, nervousness, um, intimidation, excitement, energy, fear, all of that. And um, my answer to you is that the right answer to my question is all the words you just shared. <laughs> They're all the right answer. And what I hope today is that um, you walk away from this conversation with a mindset of how to approach this work um, in a way that you will feel comfortable. So we're gonna come back to that question again at the end. Thank, thank you everyone for your share. So why is this the unrealized potential of um, open education? And it comes down to uh, that that phrase or term I'm sure you've heard so often in the last year, especially systemic racism. Um, and I want to kind of pull out a couple of phrases uh, that were in the Wikipedia definition of systemic racism, otherwise known as institutional racism. 
and, and think about how they relate to academic publishing. So systemic racism, um, the first phrase in, is embedded in normal practices. So it's something that just is so normal, we don't see it as a problem or we don't even see it as racism. Uh, and the other, the other phrase is that it happens in established and respected forces in society. And I think that for me really kind of embodies um, what we many of us would say about academic publishing, right? It's, it's a very established and respected force of society. And it's a way of doing things that we know and trust. And part of why um, academic publishing has not really diversified is it's that established way and normal practice of doing and thinking about things. And your authors, as they come to you or as you start thinking about publishing support and thinking about how to help people, um, really I want you to start thinking about how do we challenge that normal way of doing things? How do we challenge that established force? And that is something that we can't do on our own. And that's the other way that um, academic publishing really kind of su supports the systematic racism and exclusion that it has over years is uh, most authors or creators are very individual. And when we're writing our own content, um, we are limited incredibly to our own perspective. And even if we're trying to pay attention or be aware, what we see and, and what we know and understand about this incredible world we live in is very small. And so what I love about open education and why I think it has real potential to affect some significant change in higher ed in this issue is that we are collaborative. It's a collaborative publication process um, and you're not on your own. I liken thinking about DEI and publishing um, and writing to art. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's one of my favorite writers, uh, wrote this essay on art. And what he says is that everyone who wants to be an artist aims to create, not imitate somebody else's work. We all want to create our own unique uh, material. And he basically makes the argument that that's impossible, that whatever we do, and to use his words, um, we cannot emancipate ourselves from the country, politics, religion, um, art and culture of the age that we're in. It all is reflected in what we do. And academic publishing has not reflected the world that we live in. And so what we're trying to create and what our authors are writing is a reflection of how they see academic publishing working, how we're supposed to write textbooks, how we're supposed to make materials, how we're supposed to address these issues instead of being reflective of what we're in. And so as we engage in conversation with authors or creators. Um, we're gonna try to teach them how to have perspective, right? And so to do that, I, I really feel like establishing some ground rules for yourselves is the first step. Um, in any kind of equity or anti-racism conversations that you have, there is always gonna be a risk, a risk that it goes slightly awry, that someone misunderstands you. And we have to accept that and say, you know what, it might not go perfectly, but we're gonna wait in any way because it's worth the risk to change this world. <laughs> it's worth the risk to do it like we should be, to do it better. Um, and also understand that even if you share all this information that I'm gonna walk you through today, um, you share a thousand resources, how the content comes out is not your responsibility. It's the authors. Your responsibility is to give them what they need to succeed and support them, but don't take ownership of their content. Um, the, 
The other thing that I think is really important in equity conversations is honesty. And unfortunately, we live at a time where we just went through a couple of decades of political correctness, <laughs> where we, we all tried to say it right and not say the wrong thing. And we can't actually address an issue unless we're okay with calling it out and being honest about it. And it's okay to say things like, did you realize all the images in your textbook have only white people in them? That's all right. We can't fix it unless we can honestly say what's wrong with it. So that's important. And then the last is to actively care for yourself. These conversations, again, sometimes there's risk. Sometimes they're not easy. And I think the best thing that you can do is know what it is that you need to be armed with to go into conversations like this. Is it a bunch of resources? Do you need training? Do you need materials? Do you need to just not to know that you're not alone? Um, those are things that we can provide uh, that this community has out there and you're never alone in this work. Uh, we're all committed to it at whatever level we can. So think about what you need and it's the cost of this to you as you engage in this work. So how to talk to authors or creators and help them in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. My best advice with authors is you want to start out with two questions, asking them what their goal in creating this material is, and then how can you help support them? And they oftentimes are not gonna know the answer to the second question. They have no idea, right? Um, but their goal isn't always content creation. That's where we tend to focus. But we want their goal to be a little bit bigger. And that is with open education, especially um, using the OEN's uh, community values, right? <laughs> we want students to succeed. We want them to get the content, not just freely, but quality content that they can um, really take. And, and someone cannot create that all on their own. So creation, um, even though I like creativity, it's limiting in this area. And it's a space where um, the open community can provide a lot of help. And, I'll, and I'll, I will come back to that. If their goal is to just deliver content, really what they're doing is uh, furthering this um, established system of how academic publishing goes. And it, it, it's leaving our students less engaged in the material and it's not preparing them to engage with the incredibly diverse world we live in. And so by creating better, more inclusive content, we're actually providing these life lessons basically for our students. We're teaching them how to talk to people. We're teaching them how to engage with the world in addition to the content. And I think that's what faculty, instructors, authors, they want for their students. They just don't know how to go about it. So the first step is asking them to think about their students, right? The audience isn't your colleague. Is your colleague gonna learn, read this and think, oh, that's good, high quality academic writing, right? Hopefully, but really my goal is to reach my student, right? So who's the audience? And with that question, we can step away from professional academic writing and start writing in a way that our students can understand. For me, that begins with, is the language approachable? We all in this meeting are familiar with academia, but what about the first generation student who lives in a rural area and has never engaged with academic writing. Is the language overwhelming? Is it too much? Do you take time to build vocabularies about normal everyday systems or processes that your students might not know? They might not be coming in um, and, and find that they can even understand like an intro to writing textbook if the vocabulary and the language isn't approachable. 
Um, are the scenarios relatable? Are the situations something that they may have experienced or are they something that you've experienced from your position as the writer? Uh, we can talk about privilege any day, <laughs> any day. <laughs> that's not a conversation for today, but there's a presumption that I as the writer can share these experiences and they might not be experiences that my students understand or even comprehend. So we talk a lot in academics about making your material, like teaching your students how it's applicable to the world and potentially jobs. But if it's not relevant to them and where they're coming from, that applicability gets lost. Uh, and so kind of talking about or making an author um, aware of the fact that that application might not make sense to your student is a great way for them to start rethinking how they're creating materials. That also goes into um, design equity, which is um, a lot in how the, the material looks. So the textbook or the um, website or any of the course material. Is there a diversity of representation in the examples, experiences, and images in the names that we use? Um, the formats that are available, did we just give it to our students in a giant PDF that those with low or no internet at home can't download? Um, or did we give them options? And both print and Digital options are really important in OER work uh, when you're publishing. Think about how can students get a copy of this? And those are great foundational questions. After we're addressing students, um, then, I, then talking about accessibility is really secondary. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on accessibility standards because that you will cover next week. But I do wanna talk about um, a to the reader section and the image of the biology textbook that Karen showed earlier today where there were clear lines and markers to show students like where to go in the next section or a to the reader, like how you use this material, how you use the additional resources, what do they apply to? Are you connecting the ancillary materials back to the textbook chapters or the lessons or the lectures? And again, that goes back to that. We're teaching our students material, but we're also teaching them how to engage with the material that we create. And that's going to create a more um, inclusive and accessible content that our students can use. And then the last section, so we're going to talk about students, accessibility, and then the last section, which is the hardest one, is talking about content. Is our content diverse, inclusive, and equitable, equitably representative of its subject? And that is kind of tricky because that's the part where you have conversations with faculty who think that they are inclusive. Um, and so again, our job isn't to make the material inclusive, it's, it's to uh, give them these questions that they can start asking. And so to create really good DEI material, um, I have three areas that I really focus on. Um, the subject coverage, the perspectives covered, and then language. And so we're gonna go through those a little bit more. Um, so subject coverage, um, honestly covering materials. <laughs> Again, honesty is really important. Um, whatever the topic, is it addressed? And does it include everything it needs to? And if it doesn't, does it honestly say that it doesn't? So for example, um, The History of Women's Suffrage by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It is this huge multi-volume text, right? Written by these two women uh, in the New England area. And 
It attempts to address the entire topic of women's suffrage, but it's only their life experiences. So not to you know, put down that text because that's I found a foundational one. <laughs> but does it honestly say this is only the materials from these two people? Okay, so that's what I mean by honest um, coverage. Uh, perspectives covered in the material. So are we including everyone's, um, everyone's perspectives that are relevant to the material? And is there first person accounts? Now, a lot of, again, a lot of your authors don't know all this information or don't have access to it. And that's where we can be supporters and connecting them with other open resources or library resources that can supplement and help them to include that in their text. So another example would be if I'm writing, and history is an easy one to pick on in this, this topic. Um, if I'm writing a textbook, a, a section about um, the Mexican-American War, and I only include information from the perspective of the American soldiers and not the Mexican soldiers or what was happening in their country and their per perspective or the towns that were ravaged by these wars happening in the Southwest, um, then I'm missing perspectives that are important for my students to understand the topic. And then the last is language. Uh, and that's a little bit different than approaching it from where we started is the language approachable and understandable. Uh, this is really talking about inclusive language and microaggressions. So how we treat and talk about um, different people groups in the way that the languages that we use, different um, categories of people, uh, races, genders, ages, um, ableism. Uh, I recently learned about language on, took a class on language that is, um, violent when we talk about people that have encountered or endured violence and how to not use terminology that could be traumatic or triggering to those people. And so it's very interesting. There's all kinds of microaggressions that help support this established system of um, rather exclusive content. And we want to challenge ourselves for that. Um, and I really want to, like, I just, I know I just gave you a ton of information. So I want us to like take a step back and say, it's not your job to know all of that or fix all of that within a text as a published publishing supporter um, in whatever role you're doing. Your role is to ask for help. And I know every one of your campuses has at least one saucy librarian who's always available to like answer questions. That's what we do as librarians. Um, so ask, ask a librarian, ask the community, ask the you know Google group, ask for help in finding materials that can support your faculty. Our job is to start questioning and thinking about these areas and to challenge our authors that we work with to question and think about them as well. Because the more we're paying attention the less likely we are to revert back to our staid and easy and practiced and well-established ways of creating academic materials. And the more likely we are to actually create materials that are not only free and open, but connect our students to subjects in a way that's honest and uh, representative of them and their lives. And it is easier to create it than to go back and try and fix it. So if we're thinking about these foundationally um, from the start, from every project, if you're putting these ideas in the hands of your authors, we will be successful in this. And then instead of staying in the same place, we'll be actually heading towards the bright um, and beautiful and <laughs> representative world of publishing the academic publishing could be. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides and
I would like you all to do the same question that I asked from the start, which is put in um, the chat a feeling <laughs> that you have about including um, DEI materials into your ab um, open publishing practice. And I really want to feel like I'm really hoping you feel like a little less intimidated, a little more excited. Oh yes, great comments. Yeah, so we have time for chat and I um, really kept it quite <laughs> um, smushed together so that you all would have space to ask questions. So if you want to put questions in the chat or um, unmute your, mute your microphones, we have lots of time for questions about this. Yes, thank you, Christina. I will echo that. We always try to leave time for discussion and questions. So we have about 15 minutes. So as you think about what more you might wanna talk about or questions for Christina or one another, I would just like to echo one of the points Christina made as she wrapped up her talk, which is, um, you know, we're all in different places with OER. We're all probably in different places with DEI and accessibility. And one of the reasons why uh, we're talking about these issues right at the start, right up front, is because it is good to think about it and be thoughtful uh, from the beginning, rather than viewing creating representative texts or creating accessible texts as sort of something that has to be remediated at the end. Um, and so the more we can plan, uh, both with these issues, but in everything else we'll talk about uh, throughout Pub 101, the more we can plan and anticipate, I think the more satisfied you and your authors and the students will be with the material that you uh, work together to create. So, um, so I hope that by anticipating uh, some of these issues and pausing to think about them now rather than later, that that's useful to you as you navigate um, what kind of support you can offer. So I see some questions in the chat, great. So I'm gonna just go in order <laughs> uh, and then please feel free to put more. Um, so uh, Rebecca, you asked if there was a good example that of OER that um, can sh be shared with faculty creators. There's quite a few actually. Um, and I will put in the class notes a link to an, an inventory of textbook materials that are OER that have really good uh, DEI content in it. Um, maybe pull that up right now. But the one that comes off the top of my head is Everyday Social Justice. And I believe that's the website, everydaysocialjustice.com. But there's, I think she has three sociology textbooks now, and that's a great reference. And other good references would be things that have um, faculty who have used open pedagogy and students work to help create their texts. Those tend to be really well represented. Um, and then let's see. Oh, thanks, Karen, for sharing that. Let me go back up here to the next time. Uh, John asked, long term is OER competing with traditional publishers? Um, I just have a personal opinion answer for that. And I think, yes, I think we've seen it um, change the way publishing is happening a little bit, especially uh, since 2009-10 when Obama um, enacted a couple of laws that help support us. I think this pandemic and the um, climate that it's putting higher ed in uh, will also help. <laughs> Uh, move a lot of our efforts more towards OER than uh, traditional academic publishing. And I think that's going to be largely driven by our students. Um, but that's just an opinion. 
I agree. And I think some of the evidence we've seen of OER's impact on traditional publishing is apparent in many of the inclusive models, the inclusive access models that you're seeing, um, where traditional publishers have, you know, slightly changed how they roll out materials to students. They have access from day one, for example, which used to be and still is a talking point for OER. Um, John, it, it's a great question. And I think it also speaks to a, a common question authors sometimes have, which is, you know, I'm, I'm giving up my royalties in creating OER. And uh, that is true, but it's true very rarely. It's, it's the very exceptional textbook and textbook author that has any kind of um, exciting income coming from a textbook. For the majority of textbook authors, it's more modest. And there are lots of other reasons uh, to emphasize creating OER. And I'm sure that there are people on this call who have resources, John, if that's, some, if, if that's sort of the point that you're at and you're looking more at kind of a, a survey of open education and OER more broadly, uh, we can point you in that direction too. And the, the resource that uh, Rebel linked in from library publishing, which I think is uh, linked at, on the Pub 101 page too, um, is a really great resource. I just want to point that out. It's, it's nice and well written. Um, Kenna's comment, can you talk about strategies you found useful when interacting with resistant faculty? Um, I, I found that if faculty have like a list of questions or you can get them to do kind of a intro conversation or mini webinar or video or something with you to introduce these ideas, uh, that helps a lot. Um, in Montana, we've started having every faculty who gets any kind of new course um, that they're switching, who gets any kind of grant, go through uh, an instructional design uh, course and we make this a required part of it. So even introducing them to the idea is helpful or getting it kind of embedded in what you do. Um, I think faculty are more resistant to making accessible materials than making diverse materials. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I've found more struggles personally with that. Um, so it, doing things like having your images be more openly representative of your student body or names or scenarios, those are easy things for them to tackle. So if you give them a list and introduce them with, here's, you know, kind of a checklist, why don't you make sure you have this stuff? Um, those are approachable. And then the more they think, the harder ones, the content area, um, it's their personal, you know, it's their personal responsibility. It's not yours. And Again, I can say a thousand things about why they should all do this, but, but I don't control the world. And we want people to, to be independent and create their own, um, have their own academic freedom. So really giving them like almost just baby step starting places to the thinking about this is the best approach I know. Um, Eva had a comment about accessible OER. Um, yeah, so you'll hear some really good content next week about that. And, you know, I just mentioned it because it is a part of equity and inclusion, but um, Jackie, your speaker next week will go in depth and give you some practical things. Um, I would agree with Eva that it's a concern. And I think the biggest challenge is the audio impaired. Uh, I don't know a lot of resources that are dealing with that. I know right now, one of my favorite new sites is LibreText, which will take any OER material that's posted on any other site and modify it and recreate it into accessible formats. 
and that that's just part of what they do. So if you find materials, you can actually reach out to them and they're on the OEN um, community list as well, but they will uh, put it into accessible formats. And I think that includes everything but audio. Heather, I, I see your comment here. I think this is um, something you probably posted when we were talking about traditionally public textbooks and that traditional uh, publishers can pay faculty for their time to write and other support time. And you're absolutely right. Um, that's a lot of publishing support that not many institutions can provide at this point. So I agree um, with, with your point. And if that wasn't your point, feel free to correct me. I think all of you can unmute. So if you prefer to ask your question, it would be lovely to hear your voice. Heather, I see you unmuted, so please. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, yeah, we had a summer symposium, uh, textbook affordability symposium, where we were taking faculty syllabi and trying to map them to existing OER or possibly uh, textbooks that we had available through our library, like uh, freely accessible to the students through the ebook system. And I think there were just some subjects where we couldn't find OER to cover them. and. I know there was one chemistry teacher, I think he was doing a course on chemical reactors and I tried my best, but I could not find anything to help him. Um, and also I can totally relate to uh, the challenge in getting uh, faculty and other people, staff possibly interested in learning how to make content accessible. It, it does seem to be a large challenge. Absolutely. And um, Krista, I see your question here about listing in-house grant or incentive programs for faculty to create OER. And a lot of those uh, are from institutions themselves. I'm not sure if you're asking about sort of a, like a, a federal level or a broader level uh, pot of money, um, but most of the time that's found within a, a system or an institution. I'm sure there's many uh, people here who might be able to share an example. Um, yeah, my question was um, not outside funding, but within the institution funding, are there examples, you know, what criteria, how much money you give, um, what time period, um, what, you know, is it full textbooks? Do you yes. give some, you know, lower amounts for, for pieces of things? Because <laughs> kind of we, you. we have a grant program for adopting OER, but we're looking at incentives for creating. Got it. Thank you for clarifying. We will talk a lot about that in the coming weeks with call for proposals and uh, MOUs in particular. So using the MOU as a communication vehicle or a clarifying vehicle to say, here's what the deliverables are. Here's when we expect them. Here's when you'll be paid. And we do have probably half a dozen examples that you can modify. Uh, locally and then talk with one another about, you know, some of the trade-offs. Um, one thing I've heard almost everyone say, for example, is um, wait to pay until you have the completed, um, the completed textbook. But some people might want to space it out and, and pay a little after the first draft, but we do have examples of those uh, nitty-gritty details. Okay, that's great. I was just wondering if there was, you know, a website where people could put links to, you know, their open website about these kinds of things. Yes, and I, I've gathered that and it's within, uh, I think it's unit two. Uh, as you go through unit two, you'll see um, links to Virginia Tech, for example, Portland State, uh, Miami University, we do have specific examples uh, there that you can just click through. So hopefully that is what you're looking for, but if not, let me know. When we... that, is, that is, so thank you. I'll sure. wait and see. Okay. Um, I see that we are at the hour. So I just wanna take a moment to thank Christina for joining us as we kick off Pub 101 and thank all of you for being willing to participate. I know this is a, a stressful time. Um, 
And so I appreciate that you are all here together. I will add the email addresses for those of you who um, put them in chat and you'll see a note from me before the end of the week about what to expect next week. So thanks everybody and take care.